Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on the development of an innovation corridor test bed for shared electric, connected, and automated transportation in the city of Riverside. My name is Mike Sintetos. I'm the policy director for the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. I'll be moderating the webinar today. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a quick introduction. Um, this is part of our monthly webinar series that um, the NCST sponsors. We're part of the University Transportation Centers Program, which is administered by the US Department of Transportation. And we're a consortium of six universities uh, around the country focused on advancing environmentally sustainable transportation through cutting edge research, direct policy engagement, and education of our future leaders. Today's webinar is also sponsored by the Center for Environmental Research and Technology at UC Riverside, which you'll hear more about in just a moment. Today's webinar will last an hour and 15 minutes. We'll have a presentation from Dr. Matt Barth of the University of California, Riverside. And then we'll welcome a guest respondent from the city of Riverside, Nathan Mustafa. And then we'll have Q&A um, uh, uh, following Nathan's remarks. Uh, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom webinar platform, you'll find the Q&A button on that bottom toolbar of your screen. Send um, your questions and we'll do our best to answer all of them as we go along. Um, and then a final reminder, we will be recording the webinar and the recording will be available with closed captioning on our website along with the slides uh, following the presentation. With that, let's jump into it. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Matt Barth. He's the Jaeger Family Professor at the College of Engineering at the University of California, Riverside. And he's also the director of the Center for Environmental Research and Technology. And finally, he's the associate director uh, of our National Center for Sustainable Transportation. So Dr. Barth, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Mike. Let me turn on the shared screen. Okay, so hopefully, let me move this here, okay. Um, thank you, Mike, for the uh, introduction. Um, so again, my name is Matt Barth. Uh, I've been here at UC Riverside for roughly 28 years. And so uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, interesting research in the environmental side uh, and, and coming up with interesting transportation solutions. Um, so the topic um, that we're going to talk about today, and you're going to hear it probably several times, is this innovation corridor. And um, I'll, of course, explain that in, in the lecture today. Um, but the, the main thing, um, we're going to focus in on a particular NCST uh, project that actually utilized this testbed corridor. Um, and then I'll finish off the talk talking a little bit more about some of the future projects and other projects that are actually using this. Um, so just very quickly to give background on CSERT. So CSERT is the Center for Environmental Research and Technology. Um, it's also been around uh, at UC Riverside since 1992, so 28 years old. And um, it's a multidisciplinary center that focuses on uh, a lot of things that deal with air quality, transportation, and energy. Um, you know, there's a, a number of different researchers focused on uh, measuring emission sources and coming up with uh, clean tech solutions. Um, there's atmospheric modeling. If you look at the area here on the right side, there's quite a bit of work on the sustainable transportation side. Again, uh, doing this work uh, closely with our colleagues at uh, ITS Davis and, and other members of NCST. Um, also some fuels work and then more of a recent uh, area that we've been working in is renewable electricity, smart grids and things like that. Um, so if, if we dive down now in terms of what type of work do we do in sustainable transportation, it's generally focused on these four areas. And I think if you've listened to other ITS, Davis and NCST webinars, we often refer to you know, these different revolutions going on within transportation. Um, so we, we touch on a lot of uh, technology issues associated with things like shared mobility, uh, electrification of, of you know, both light duty and heavy duty vehicles, and then uh, the connectivity and automation piece. So we have a number of active research projects in, in, in all these, um, and um, a lot of them uh, deal with uh, you know, algorithms and theoretical things, but we also like to do things that are very applied. So looking at, for example, uh, how can shared mobility help the city of Riverside? And on electrification, it's not just looking at uh, the light duty, but also how are we going to do this um, with, with the heavy duty side? 
And when we talk about electrification, we don't always necessarily just mean battery electric. We also look at things such as uh, fuel cell vehicles uh, and hybrid vehicles as well. Um, the, the majority of what we're going to talk about today, though, deals with the connectivity. And what we mean by connectivity is really, uh, you know, how can we take advantage of the fact that uh, vehicles can communicate with the outside world, whether that's, um, you know, with other vehicles or with the infrastructure or just getting additional information in order to improve driving. And then lastly, the automation piece, uh, I'm sure everyone has heard in the you know, news and, and everything else about automated vehicles, autonomous vehicles, they're coming. I think one thing that, that um, people sometimes uh, don't necessarily um, you know, come to the forefront is that there's different levels of automation and we're already seeing uh, further and further penetration of these automation levels that help drivers uh, do a better job, not just in terms of safety and mobility, but there's a lot of tools out there now that allow uh, drivers to drive more, you know, eco-friendly, you know, in terms of saving fuel and then reducing emissions. And so that's part of what we've been trying to develop for a number of years. Just to give uh, sort of a, a different uh, list of uh, projects and areas. So uh, variations of intersection management. Uh, you know, intersections themselves uh, with traffic signals and all that, that's one of the more sort of inefficient things that we have in our transportation network, the fact that people have to queue up and wait for signal changes and all that. So that's one area that we've tried to improve on in terms of reducing fuel consumption and reducing emissions associated with, uh, you know, not just uh, how the traffic signal controller works, but how uh, drivers and the vehicles can also help uh, reduce those uh, uh, energy and emission. Um, then um, I already mentioned, we do all sorts of eco driving techniques um, and it's across the board, not just intersections, but on uh, freeways, uh, arterial corridors and things like that. And we've developed over the, the years, a number of different tools that, that help on that. Um, eco routing is another one, um, very big in uh, freight and, and things like that in terms of what's the best route to take. And, you know, just simply not necessarily always taking the quickest route uh, can have pretty significant improvements in terms of saving fuel and reducing emissions by looking at other eco routing opportunities. Um, other things, uh, arterial roadway management, uh, dynamic powertrain is an interesting one where you can use outside information uh, about roadway conditions, about uh, you know, traffic, things like that, and use that to actually fine tune, for example, how a hybrid vehicle would work. Uh, and so we've touched on, on research in that area. And then lastly, uh, uh, working in the sustainable freight arena as well, which, which is uh, very, very active uh, since we have these new mandates that are um, you know, having us go more and more towards the electrification. All right, so um, we do, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, algorithm development. And what we usually do is we test it first in simulation. So we do a lot of simulation modeling. Um, but one thing that we really like to do is to actually test things in the real world. And so we have a number of instrumented vehicles at CSERT that we use for our, our, our research. Um, but you know, if we wanna take this to some part that requires infrastructure to, for example, have communication with the vehicles, um, there's only a certain number of places where we can do that. Um, we've worked uh, with our colleagues at UC Berkeley for a number of years up in the uh, Bay Area, uh, specifically uh, in Palo Alto, they have uh, El Camino Real has a number of traffic signals that have this communication capability. Um, and, uh, but just more recently, you know, we've been doing uh, more with uh, down here at the port of Los Angeles, where we've set up some corridors we, we, where we allow communication between the infrastructure and vehicles, specifically the trucks. But really the focus of today's talk is on what we've done at the city of Riverside. And it's really, um, I'll show a, a more detailed map in just a moment, but it's really allowing us to do the research locally. And I must uh, also say that it's been fantastic working with the city of Riverside because it's part of their smart city vision in terms of how we want to build that out. 
Um, the city itself uh, has what's called an innovation district. Uh, and, you know, this is a, a portion of a map that shows, you know, downtown Riverside's located here, the University of California Riverside's located here. And of course, the main corridor that connects those two things is University Avenue, which is the innovation corridor that we're going to talk about. But really what we're trying to do with this area, you know, working with the city and, and companies is to really make this, uh, uh, you know, part of the smart city strategy, uh, improve transportation and improve how we deal with energy, improve uh, how we uh, get around in terms of different types of mo mobility. Uh, so it's really part of a long-term plan that's being conducted by the city. Here, here's um, the corridor itself. Again, UCR is sitting here on the right side and downtown Riverside here on the left side. Um, and we have a, this University Avenue. It's about six miles long between the two ends. Um, and of course, University Avenue continues down further uh, uh, throughout the city. Um, but one of the, the main things that we've done is uh, put in traffic signal controllers that are modern that have this capability to do signal phase and timing and, and make adjustments and then also have the communication capability. So if you think about it, um, you know, we as drivers look at the traffic lights and we can tell it's red, yellow, green. Um, but the, there are now protocols that allow us to broadcast by radio what that signal phase and timing is. And so if you have another vehicle, for example, that's listening to the traffic signals broadcast what phase it's in, what the countdown is to the next phase, that really helps uh, vehicles kind of figure out, you know, what's the best speed to go at at any one moment and how to manage, uh, you know, in an eco-friendly manner, how to get through that intersection. Um, there's other components um, of the innovation quarter that we're working on. Uh, one is uh, another recent NCST project is to install air quality monitors along the corridor so that we can look at traffic patterns and look at correlations between the air quality and the traffic as it moves down the corridor. Um, we also are doing video uh, cameras and video analytics where we can figure out detailed turning movements, uh, traffic volumes, uh, and hopefully also observe pedestrians and bicycles, uh, not just being entirely focused on vehicle traffic, but looking at all forms of mobility. Um, another quick comment here is um, the California Air Resources Board is setting up its Southern California headquarters, not too far from this innovation corridor. It's about one block off uh, in this area here. And again, um, when they're up and running in spring of next year, uh, we're going to uh, try to integrate their activities as well as part of this uh, part of this research test bed. So again, this this opportunity lent itself very well. Again, working closely with the city to set this up and allow us to do the type of research on this on this real world uh, arterial roadway. This is a very messy diagram uh, to show you sort of what's the interconnections between all this in terms of the infrastructure. And I won't go through this in, in great detail, but you know, this middle section here deals with the vehicles and the vehicles have communication both through the cellular network as well as this dedicated short range communication um, that, that allows it to speak to other vehicles and to the infrastructure. This whole infrastructure sh side shows uh, you know, the, the traffic signal controllers, there's uh, what we call edge computing, these grid smart processors that go into the traffic cabinets, there's cameras, uh, here's the air quality sensor. All these are connected again through different types of communication, whether it's, uh, you know, a hard line connection or a Wi-Fi connection or this dedicated short range communication. All this other stuff out here is sort of the, the back office where we have data servers that uh, provide additional information to the vehicles um, and then also records a lot of the different activity patterns um, the, so that we can go back, analyze the data and make calculations. For example, how much energy did we save? How much emissions did we actually reduce? So this is an ever expanding diagram because we keep adding more and more to the, uh, to the test bed. 
Um, I mentioned already that you know a large part of what we do, at least at first, is when we come up with a new algorithm, is that we test it in in a, a traffic simulation model, um, and so in parallel, um, we have very detailed um, you know. Uh, infrastructure that is part of you know what how many lanes are there uh, we put in different types of vehicles and, and on the next slide i'll show you some of the output of that but you know this allows us to test you know in the simulation world how would this actually work in terms of uh you know is it is it safe uh, does it improve how quickly we can move down the corridor and then more importantly, when we couple it with uh, energy and emission models, we can figure out how much energy is it going to save us and how much are we going to reduce the emissions and improve the air quality. So this is a video, hopefully people can see this, but this is the traffic simulation model. This is one uh, snippet of it. Um, this is actually simulating a bus going down the innovation corridor here. Um, this is sort of a simulated view of what it would look like. And then the other thing that's interesting about this is this is a real bus that's on top of our dynamometer. It's a treadmill, and we're actually exercising this bus as if it were driving down uh, the roadway. And this is, this is nice because it allows us to test the uh, emissions of that bus uh, as it's in our, in our research area here and um, you know, as if it were traveling down the road. So this is a hardware in the loop setup that takes advantage of this traffic simulation here, and then our dynamometer laboratories over here. This driver's aid in the mi middle is uh, advice that's being provided to the driver about what speed should it be traveling at at any one time. And this is where we get our, our energy and emission savings is by providing advice to the drivers. In subsequent testing, we hope to do more on the automation side so that the drivers don't have to necessarily follow a, a, a driver's aid. Uh, it would just happen more or less automatically. So one of the uh, key things in terms of intersection management is if you're broadcasting the signal phase and timing from a traffic light, um, this goes out maybe um, you know 300 meters or so. So if a car is within 300 meters of the intersection, then it should be able to listen to what is the countdown to red, what is the countdown to green, depending on what phase you're in. And this has been a research area of well over a decade. Um, we're, we're not the only ones that are looking at this. There's a number of good research papers from different organizations. Um, the federal government calls it the eco approach and departure at signalized intersections as the application name, but Europe calls it GLOSA. There's other names throughout the literature, but it's in, in addition to doing let's adjust the phase and timing in order to get like nice green waves of vehicles going down a roadway. It also allows vehicles to change their speed in order to smooth out the traffic flow on that particular corridor. So, you know, things that you might imagine, you could coast down earlier to a red light, you can maybe speed up a little bit to get through on a green light. If you do all these different things, you know, we've seen energy savings in the range of 10 to 20%, which, you know, it might not seem so much from a light duty vehicle perspective, but for heavy duty, that's, that's a pretty significant savings. So, um, we've done uh, simulation modeling as well as uh, real world applications that have shown those actual numbers. Um, again, another video, hopefully people can see this. This is just showing, um, you know, how uneven traffic is on the upper panel versus this eco approach and departure, departure tends to smooth out the traffic flow. And it might be a little bit hard to see on the webinar, but this is just a quick sped up version that shows uh, the traffic smoothing effect. Okay, so um, we've done a number of experiments on our innovation corridor, um, but we've also done uh, work, as I mentioned, up in uh, Palo Alto. Um, we've done some work with the Federal Highway Administration out in McLean, Virginia. And so we've, we've developed these algorithms, put them into the vehicles, and done these tests uh, at various locations. 
And if you look at this column here, you're getting different energy savings depending on certain conditions. You know, how much uh, of the vehicle fleet has the technology? What's the vehicle mix in terms of light duty versus heavy duty? Uh, it matters quite a bit in terms of whether you have fixed time signals versus actuated signals. Um, there's algorithms for both of those. Um, and other things such as road grade, uh, number of lanes that you have, uh, queue prediction, all these things are sort of the variables that kind of vary how much energy savings and emission savings that you can achieve. Um, and so um, as part of the NCST project, it was to further develop the innovation corridor, which, which we've done with the hardware and, and of course the algorithms. But one of the highlights of this particular project was to run a number of experiments um, utilizing this eco approach and departure traffic uh, intersection management system. So this is a research paper that came out of the project and um, um, I need to acknowledge uh, my, st my student, uh, David Oswald, who conducted the majority of these experiments with a number of others. But what we did was take two vehicles, um, vehicles that were instrumented. Uh, one vehicle had this eco approach and departure technology on it, the other one did not. And then we ran them more or less simultaneously down the innovation corridor. And what we wanted to do is to compare one against the other to see what is the uh, total energy savings uh, that we could achieve. And in addition, what we did is I mentioned we're doing simulation modeling of this that we can go back and apply different kinds of emission models in order to figure out, you know, how well do these emission models, how sensitive are they to this traffic smoothing effect? And so the point of the paper was, compared measurements against this modeling output, output. The EPA has this moves emissions model, and there's the other, uh, what we call modal emission models that, that give a slightly better answer. So just to give you an idea, when we talk about this project level emissions modeling, if you have, for example, a velocity pattern versus time, as you see up here, you would apply that to an emissions model, and then it would predict what is your fuel consumption and what are your emissions. There's vehicle parameters that go into this, and you can either measure your velocity pattern or you can derive it from a traffic simulation model. So that kind of gives an overview of how we do our emissions modeling. Um, the, the EPA has what's called the MOOS model, stands for Motor Vehicle Emission Simulator. This was developed um, probably, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, over 10 years ago. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a modeling um, approach that uses uh, bins. Uh, we have power along one side of the matrix and speed on another. And it's a methodology for estimating, you know, if you have a velocity trajectory, you can go through, apply this model, and it's going to tell you what your emissions were uh, for that particular driving pattern. Um, another method is a, a modal emission model where it has analytical formula, formulas that dictate, you know, what, how much power are you using, um, what's the functionality of, of uh, emissions after treatment. Um, but it goes through and it predicts, just like the other one, what the emissions should be and what the fuel consumption should be. And that's across a wide variety of different vehicle types. So these are the two models that we compare to the actual measurements of what we did on the road. So the ex here's the experiments. As I mentioned, we used the innovation corridor. We uh, had three intersections instrumented at the time. So the two vehicles would essentially drive up and down University Avenue. And as I mentioned, one vehicle had this eco approach and departure technology, the other one did not. Um, and then uh, the models themselves took the vehicle uh, velocity data and then post-processed what the emissions would be if you use purely an emissions model. Here's uh, another video um, just showing you, this is a, a drone footage. This is the arterial corridor, that's University Avenue at one of the intersections. Um, this is highlighted here where this communication, dedicated short range communication set up on the traffic pole here. So it's broadcasting the signal phase and timing to the vehicles. Um, and then um, 
the vehicles are coming down. This is kind of a light uh, traffic conditions. Um, and then uh, one of our vehicles will pop into view and it'll be going towards the intersection. And the driver is following this advice that's given up here in the upper left in terms of what speed should it be going at. And as I mentioned, you know, this can be easily automated for the future using something like adaptive cruise control or something like that. But um, anyway, this, this just kind of gives you an indication of what the corridor looks like and how the experiments were carried out. So yeah, actually here comes one of our vehicles as it drives down. In this particular case, it, uh, it sees that it's red, so it's slowing way down early. Uh, so it's kind of coasting down, saving energy instead of just speeding up and slamming on the brakes. And so we go through a lot of different scenarios, uh, the stop conditions, the drive through information. So it's, uh, when we do the final analysis, we look at a lot of different driving cases for when those uh, vehicles went through. So it's, it's roughly three hours of driving around collecting data on this. Okay, so here, here are the results. So essentially, um, you know, if you compare the eco approach and departure uh, vehicle versus the non technology vehicle, um, we measured, and this is actual measurements, uh, roughly a 6.6% improvement to uh, the fuel uh, economy and the CO2 emissions. Um, the other model predictions, as I mentioned, um, also had similar results. Uh, the CMEM model predicted that we saved 4.5, um, and then the EPA MOVES model predicted that we had right around 2.6% uh, percent improvement. Um, one of the purposes of this paper was to show that um, based on the methodology that the EPA uses for this MOVES model, because you're using bins, it tends to kind of wash out some of the traffic smoothing effects. So um, we've seen this in other studies just where we're seeing a benefit uh, from these different um, uh, traffic smoothing techniques. It's just that when you use a pure modeling technique such as MOVES, it kind of understates what the, the total impact could be as we show here uh, based on a direct comparison to the measurements. So um, the paper is, is uh, listed here um, and uh, Again, just the main point of this was this traffic smoothing effects uh, tend to get washed out. And the main reason is because of the size of these bins within moves. One of the proposals in the paper was to also have what we call sub bins, uh, where you can take these coarse bins and then uh, for cases where you want to actually get these detailed smoothing effects and account for them, you can use a, a smaller subset of bins in order to capture that. So if you're interested in that, of course, uh, the paper's listed here that goes into details on, on how that can take place. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this. Uh, this is basically uh, talking about how we're improving our, our algorithm for actuated signals. Um, and then move on to talk a little bit more about what are the other studies that we're doing on the innovation corridor. Um, I mentioned we've uh, done a hybrid electric bus and we've moved it along the, the corridor as well and done testing in our laboratory. So the interesting thing about this is not only is it doing that same eco approach and departure at the, at the signalized intersections, it's also dynamically changing its hybrid energy management strategy based on knowing where it is, what the traffic conditions are, where the bus stops are. And if you sum all that together, that bus was able to get close to 24% energy improvement uh, again, through not only by changing the speed of the bus at different times, but how it manages the onboard energy. Um, another thing that's come up that's, that's very important is uh, also looking at the lane level details, right? So knowing what lane you're in, whether you're gonna do a left turn or right turn or go straight matters quite a bit for a lot of these different uh, applications. And so being able to differentiate what lane you're in as you drive down the road is a real important research problem. Um, and so that's what this uh, um, project is doing. It's trying to establish better ways of detecting, are you in lane one, are you in lane two, or are you in the left turn pocket? 
um, and, and we're able to uh, do that lane level type of positioning. Um, there's another paper that we've done on, on that topic if you're interested in that area. And then the air quality sensors. Um, as you probably heard, there's a number of these low cost air quality sensors that are out there now. Uh, and more and more uh, people are, are, are putting these to use at their homes, uh, along different uh, streets and roads. And so as these uh, newer sensors get out there, we're able to come up with a better kind of snapshot of what our air quality is. It's not just, uh, you know, these general models and a few sensors. It's now a lot of sensors that tell us quite a bit. And so one of our um, other researchers, Professor Sunny Ivy, is, is doing this work where she's installing along the innovation corridor uh, these, um, these uh, monitoring um, sensors that measure the uh, air quality levels. Uh, they're powered by solar energy and they broadcast uh, via cellular communications what the readings are. And so what we're doing is we're looking at correlations between the traffic patterns and the air quality along that particular corridor. And this is, this is interesting because it's not just retail, but there's a lot of communities around here too that you know the air quality is gonna have a pretty significant effect. Um, I mentioned we're installing cameras. This is some of the, this is actually uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, these new cameras have been going up along the corridor. Allows us to basically observe the vehicle traffic. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it's not just the vehicles we can observe, but we can look at things such as bicycles, skateboards, pedestrians, and things like that uh, as part of the overall analysis. So um, this is, um, uh, we, like I said, we just installed it and we're planning on uh, getting more and more of that data as part of our transportation studies. And then uh, shared mobility is another uh, thing we've been looking at. And that's mainly been focused on as a whole to the, the city of Riverside. Um, of course, you know, we have the transportation network companies uh, that have been quite prevalent throughout the community. Um, uh, there's a car sharing system that's uh, set up for the city of Riverside using hydrogen uh, fueled, uh, fuel cell vehicles. And the idea is potentially ex continue to expand our shared mobility throughout the city. Um, now, of course, um, with the current COVID situation, shared mobility is in uh, kind of a, a difficult place right now. But uh, again, we think shared mobility is gonna play a very important role of how we get around in the future. So we've, been, we've done a, a fair amount of modeling in this area, um, working with uh, colleagues at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and, and others. Uh, trying to understand, you know, this new model we call BEAM, behavior, energy, autonomy, and mobility. It allows us to see what the impacts of different forms of shared mobility might be. Uh, I, I mentioned there's uh, an existing car sharing uh, company in the city called Stratoshare. Um, the hope is to expand on that car sharing system and be able to see how we can deploy it effectively in terms of moving people around the city. And uh, just to note, this, this research is uh, in part supported by the Strategic Growth Council, again, part of, um, part of our, our research team. And then lastly, uh, the city of Riverside was very fortunate get, to get a, a, a grant from the Strategic Growth Council to look at this innovation district um, the, the corridor itself is right down the middle of this. And this is really just to, um, you know, uh, increase uh, improvements throughout the area, make it a lot more pedestrian friendly, uh, uh, improving different access to, to different things. And so we're part of that in terms of the measurement uh, side of things, look at the different metrics, collect them, and then do analysis with that. So to conclude, um, you know, we've been using this innovation test bed for a number of different things. Um, uh, researchers are able to come up with different ideas and, uh, you know, we, we've been increasing the capability of the, of the test bed. In fact, um, we just recently made it part of the Cal test bed program that's sponsored by the California Energy Commission. So if someone has a new technology that they wanna try, they're free to come and use the innovation corridor as part of that program. Um, so we're gonna to continue to expand our research in these real world experiments. 
Um, I mentioned the transportation and air quality and linking those together. Uh, we're planning on improving on our communication capability going beyond just dedicated short range communication and using these new 5G technologies that are, are coming out. Um, and then, um, you know, to further develop uh, how we manage our intersections. Um, so not just looking at, uh, let's adjust the speeds of the vehicle, but how can we co-optimize that with our phase and timing? And so we're doing a lot of simulation work there to see if we can get uh, even further improvements, not just on the energy and emission side, but in terms of Their areas. Um, so if a, another city or if we want to expand this to a larger area, we can take these lessons learned and, uh, you know, project ahead and see how, my, how beneficial they'll be in the future. So I think that's my last slide. I want to acknowledge that there's quite a bit of people that work on this, number of students and other researchers, some of them you can, you can see here. So this is an ongoing research program. And again, the um, the work we've done with the National Center for Sustainable Transportation has really helped in order to launch this and keep this type of research going. So again, thank you everyone. And um, I think I'm happy to take questions if we wanna do questions now, Mike, or I'm not sure how you wanna do it. Um, I, I think I'd, I'll ask you maybe one just clarifying question about one of your slides and then, and then we'll hear from Nathan before we get to the, the sure. broader Q and A. Uh, first of all, great presentation, thank you. I think, you know, we've gotten questions on a, a broad, broad array of uh, topics surrounding your work already. So I think there's a lot of interest. Um, the, the clarifying question is, I think one of your early slides mentioned some work um, at CSERT um, around microgrids or maybe smart grids. Can you just clarify if that was um, the design of a microgrid to somehow integrate with the innovation corridor or, 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 or kind of what that work involves? Yeah, so, so um, our, our work with microgrids um, is mainly uh, located at our research center, CSERT. So CSERT itself is a microgrid um, where, where we have renewable energy, we have solar car ports that we use uh, to, to power our buildings and, and our, um, also it's tied into our electric vehicle chargers. Um, so we, we do uh, uh, microgrid algorithm development about how to best manage energy, both for buildings as well as your, your vehicle charge management. Um, we we uh, propose to, to also do microgrids associated with the innovation corridor. So if you had electrified buses, for example, you might want to put a microgrid on, on both ends of that innovation corridor so you can uh, take advantage of opportunity charging of, say, buses when they're at, at each end of the, of the corridor. Um, so we haven't done that yet, but again, our hope, um, as with the, um, the campus as a whole, we're doing more and more in order to reach this carbon neutrality initiative, becoming more or less carbon free by, by 2025. And certainly microgrids is part of that, and we want to make that part of the innovation corridor too. Great, thank you. Um, and so like, like I said, we'll, we'll um, get to the rest of the questions in a few minutes. Um, but before we do that, um, we're gonna turn to our guest respondent now and we're uh, very grateful to be joined by Nathan Mustafa. Um, Nathan is the Deputy Public Works Director for the City of Riverside. Um, we really appreciate you joining us and um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on um, the city's approach to this partnership and the value you see in the work and, and all that. So Nathan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. Hopefully everyone's able to see my presentation. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Barth for that uh, very thorough presentation and uh, making sure I didn't have to explain any of the technical parts of that. Um, we're very grateful to have a partner with UC Riverside CSERT um, because they really augment what we can do as a city. And so we've been very happy to partner with them uh, and, and really lean on their expertise in our innovation corridor and innovation district efforts. Um, I wanted to go over just kind of the broader vision of the Innovation District and why we're so eager to partner um, on projects like this. Um, so here's just a high level overview physically of the Innovation District. You can see that certainly University Avenue is that corridor that runs through the heart of the district, but it is bounded by um, 
our central business district and older industrial area where we're perhaps envisioning uh, you know, an increased density in uses. Uh, UCR is out on the easterly end. And then we have a few other opportunity corridors and transportation hubs throughout the district. So University Avenue really is at the heart of the innovation district and, and binds it. Um, why do we want to do work in the innovation district? And there's a, there's a few reasons. Um, the, the current uh, situation in the innovation district for as uh, the lived experience of our residents uh, from an environmental standpoint is not um, the best. We have uh, by several metrics, whether it's the California Healthy Places Index, uh, through which one of the uh, census tracts has a score of uh, one, uh, which is uh, about as bad as you can get. Uh, and uh, the CalEnviro screen uh, using similar metrics has identified um, some of the highest pollutant burdens in the state within the innovation district, particularly in the east side neighborhood and in our downtown. Um, there's a lot of motivation for change and improvement uh, from an environmental justice standpoint. Uh, it's right at the nexus of two major uh, freeway corridors and these residents experience high levels of airborne pollutants. Uh, and so that's one thing that motivates us to change in the area. We also have, you know, the existing um, infrastructure and, uh, and um, kind of land use in the area is aging. Um, there's a lot of uh, older uh, industrial over towards the north end of the innovation district. Um, and then there's a lot of vacant uses such as the older hotel shown on the left of the presentation. Um, and we're looking and moving towards uh, building new uses in the area and deploying new innovative technologies. Um, you know, so this is actually a, a concept plan of that hotel area that's moving forward um, to bring in kind of a mixed use uh, dining retail uh, hub for uh, whether it's students or residents who want to enjoy um, a, a new use in the area. We're looking to deploy new technologies. Housing has already started to go in in the area. These are the mission lofts. Um, and so there, there's a lot of movement on, on that end in the innovation district. And we're motivated to do this um, because of our sustainable Riverside initiative that applies not just to the innovation district, but to the entirety of the city. Um, we're looking through these technologies that Dr. Barth is employing to attract more innovation to the area, you know, to bring in um, you know, next to the Air Resources Board or next to UCR, um, new players in the field of clean tech and clean energy. Um, we hope, you know, one day that some of the uh, efforts on Dr. Barth's team could potentially be, you know, commercialized. Um, and we hope to uh, really renovate a lot of the areas of the Innovation District. In doing so, um, we're looking to deploy new technology that makes the area more environmentally friendly uh, and also in, in a way that is socially responsible. So we want to make sure that we are mindful of things like displacement. Uh, we're mindful of uh, the, the positive impacts that we can have to people by creating access, um, not just through vehicles, but through walkable and bikeable neighborhoods. Um, some of the things that we've done recently as a city in the area is to deploy a, a new bike cut at the Metrolink station, transit hub. Um, we have installed several miles of new bike lanes. This is a Tunnel of Heroes project shown here, connecting the downtown uh, to the other portion of the innovation district, first of its kind in the region. Um, so we're looking to do a lot of new innovative things surrounding the innovation corridor. Um, some some qu uh, questions were put in the chat about what are we doing for bicycles in specific in the area, and so you know I, I'm glad I had this slide in here uh, over near the Air Resources Board. We're putting in our first uh, kind of uh, substantial on-street separated bikeway that's going to. Uh, end in two protected bike signals uh, near the Air Resources Board. We're also putting in uh, several miles of two-way class four cycle track adjacent to streets that feed the Innovation District or run through the Innovation District. We're putting in neighborhood traffic signals and several pedestrian hybrid beacons, also called Hawk signals. And those are all being constructed as we speak. Here's some of the grant projects that we received funding for. You can see they tie in, you already saw this from Dr. Barth, but what we're really trying to do is on top of this testing uh, and innovation for vehicles, make sure that we have a complementary uh, network for uh, walkable alleyways, art alleyways, bikeways, bike share stations, uh, improved or additional sidewalk where we have gaps, 
really improving the signals to add accessible pedestrian signal push buttons, uh, high visibility crossings. Um, again, we're, we're putting in a, a class four bike facility uh, connecting to this corridor and also improving a lot of the transit stops. So there's a lot of movement going on in tandem with these vehicular efforts that are really gonna make it a um, multimodal location of choice for the city of Riverside and hopefully the region. And through that, we hope to really bring life to the area um, and, and you know, augment the options for residents and reduce some of the climate impacts that they bear right now. That's all I had. Thank you very much. And I'm available for questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Um, so, so we, yeah, we certainly will have some questions for both of you. Um, a number of them have already come in. I just want to remind our attendees to go ahead and um, submit your questions using the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. So, um, so the first question I think is for both of you, and maybe Matt will ask you to kick it off. Um, you both talked a little bit about the, uh, the use of the innovation corridor, but not just passenger vehicles, but, but by other modes, buses, bikes, pedestrians. Um, so Matt, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the extent to which the, the traffic smoothing derived from, from um, some of your work maybe benefits passenger vehicles, whether kind of what the effects are on, on other road users and um, kind of how, how, the, how a system like this would affect, you know, bicyclists, pedestrians, et cetera. Yeah, so, so um, you know, of course, um, the experiments that we talked about today involved light duty vehicles, right? But the, the algorithm, the concepts can apply to any type of, of mode of transportation, right? It doesn't have to be cars necessarily. Um, you know, trucks could, could take advantage of this. And you can tune it essentially uh, in, in different ways, right? So if you have a lot of bicycle, you wanna promote a lot of bicycle traffic, you can tune it towards that. Same thing with pedestrians. So, um, you know, we're not so, just solely focused on, on the, the vehicle traffic itself. Um, we're hoping with our camera systems and other things, we can detect pedestrians, we can detect bicycles a lot better than, than we can now. And then make sure that's incorporated as part of the solution. So um, that's, that's uh, certainly a future area of research. I would also just add on to that, that in the development of a more regulated, uh, low speed, low emission corridor on University Avenue, we're reducing some of the stressors on cyclists. Um, so that in itself contributes towards the bicycling environment. Great. Um, another question for both of you. Um, we got a couple of questions about just kind of the process for developing this innovation corridor. And I think, you know, some of the interest was around kind of specifically installing the infrastructure and kind of, you know, the, um, the involvement of utilities and the relationship between the university and, and the local government and maybe both of your experiences working with other stakeholders in developing the test bed? Um, so, so there wasn't any single grant that said, hey, you know, here's a bunch of money, let's, let's do this project. It was sort of a combination of a lot of things. Um, uh, Nathan, you can, you can obviously mention some of the grant programs that you've gotten in to improve the signal uh, controllers. Um, we've gotten research project money where we've been able to install the communication equipment. And um, it's just been in this mode for the last one or two years of expanding that infrastructure from a variety of different funding sources. And the reason why it works is because, you know, just working directly with the city and the university together, we're able to get together and figure out what's the best way to proceed in terms of the technology and then how we, how we move that forward. So Nathan, I don't know if you want to say anything more on that. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of duct tape, a lot of, um, you know, spur of the moment decisions, but we do have a well thought out program, but I, I feel like um, this evolved kind of naturally uh, in a way where we reached, uh, you know, we have an MOU uh, between our agencies and we, you know, we iterate on it, but it's, it wasn't any one big, um, you know, decision or grant funding, you know, we, we 
work within our own budget and seek additional grant monies um, to augment this however we can. Uh, the TCC grant was a big one that's going to uh, add some more infrastructure and uh, detectors. Uh, but a lot of it, you know, we, we just completed part of a project by trading in an old unit that the city had and, and using some funds from CSERT um, just to, you know, work together collaboratively, collaboratively just to make things happen. Um, so a lot of just um, on the ground um, effort for this. Thanks. And in terms um, of installation, you know, I, I forgot to mention in terms of installation, we, uh, for the most part, the city crews have been assisting with the installs for a lot of the equipment in this. Great, that's helpful. So, um, so Matt, you talked uh, a lot about the implications for energy use and emissions um, for some of these techniques. Uh, we got some questions about how the eco approach and departure um, system affects drive times, um, and then also, also implications for safety of some of these technologies. Yeah, so um, in terms of intersection management, things like this eco approach and departure, um, they're, they're tunable. Um, in general, when you maximize uh, the energy savings and the emission savings, it maybe has a plus one or two percent effect on mobility. But um, again, depending on how you tune it, you could, you could uh, also do it to maximize your throughput, your mobility parameters. Um, and then in terms of, of safety, um, you, you know, I think in general, um, you, you know, it, it doesn't change uh, safety too much uh, from that effect. I mean, basically you still have car following behavior and you have uh, certain lane change behavior, but it really doesn't affect the safety uh, one way or another. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I guess more specifically, you know, the question was asking about um, pedestrian and bicyclist usage alongside of, uh, alongside of vehicles along the innovation corridor. And I guess, you know, to your earlier point about potentially tailoring some of these technologies um, to, um, to be more kind of pedestrian bicyclist focused, maybe maybe that would get at that question a little more. That's that's right. Yeah, we like I said, we started first with uh, with the light duty vehicles, but you know this is definitely expandable to multiple modes, and that's that's what we'd like to do in the future. Um, so um, lost my oh yeah. So so the um, related question to your point about drive time. Um, we also had a question about um, kind of individual level effects versus system level effects. And to the extent you've studied, you know, um, emission savings for a particular vehicle, kind of what that looks like system wide as you start introducing vehicles using this technology. Yeah, um, you know, that, that's one nice thing about this eco approach and departure technology is that. Um, First of all, you don't need a lot of uh, penetration before it sh starts showing a, a pretty significant effect. One of the studies we did showed that if you're, you know, somewhere 15, 20% of the vehicles have this technology, then you start to see a, a pretty significant overall systems benefit. And, and the reason is because if you have a few vehicles that have this technology that are slowing down and speeding up according to the traffic signal patterns, you know, vehicles behind, they tend to follow those vehicles. So you're getting a benefit from those vehicles as well. So um, the main point is just 20% uh, and up uh, tends to smooth traffic and then traffic as a whole is smoothed out and therefore you're getting the same energy and emission savings. So it's, it's, it's again, you know, there's a lot of applications that require 100% of the vehicles have the technology before it has an effect. What's nice about this application is that, you know, a small percentage can already start to show some benefit from a systems perspective. That's interesting. So, um, so a couple of questions for both of you, just to try to kind of I think give um, viewers a better sense of, of, the, um, of the corridor and the infrastructure along the corridor. Um, can you characterize, you know, most of the demos I think show, show stoplights, are there, are there stop signs, roundabouts, other infrastructure that, that, uh, that you've been studying through this effort? Um, 
So, so for specifically for the innovation corridor, it's mostly uh, signalized intersections. Um, the you know we did study stops from a bus perspective because there's bus stops along the way. Um, so we incorporated that as part of our algorithms. Uh, if if you were a bus or or you know if you're a truck doing deliveries, you could take that into account as well. Um, we we haven't done anything uh, on this particular corridor with roundabouts. Um, Roundabouts. I noticed in the in the questions and in the chat. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of advantages to roundabouts um, in terms of safety, in terms of uh, you know energy and emissions. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, there's there's throughput discussions and issues too with roundabouts. But I would say, you know, as we continue to increase the amount of automation in our vehicles, it turns out that roundabouts are a much better solution than doing, um, you know, always thinking about doing a signalized intersection. So we're not at that point yet where we have enough automation to make these big changes, but I'm, I'm a pretty big uh, proponent of roundabouts when it comes to automated vehicles. I, I don't know, Nathan, do you wanna tell your opinion of roundabouts? I could think of an intersection in UCR that would be great for a roundabout. Uh, I like roundabouts, um, but yeah, Dr. Barth, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, we don't have any particular plans uh, on the innovation corridor to evaluate or install uh, roundabout control. There, there's a lot of uh, right-of-way implications for that. Um, and where we have a very uh, dense urban area with a lot of, um, you know, what we're looking to promote with the uh, zero lot line type uh, development and uh, some of that is already existing where you have buildings very close to the, the sidewalk. It can get tough in those uh, really dense areas to kind of add an expansion project like that with a roundabout. Certainly there are modified versions that are a little bit smaller, but um, we're excited to look at roundabouts in the city. Um, there's some interest throughout the city for those and we definitely look at it for um, major projects as we evaluate alternatives. Just to follow on question to something you mentioned a second ago, Matt, about you, you studied bus stops and um, were, were there, did you find anything in terms of whether the, whether the strategy would, um, would make it, you know, easier or more difficult for a bus to kind of stay on schedule? Um, so, so um, you know, there already is technology um, for, for example, bus rapid transit to, you know, stop when there's people to be picked up or dropped off. Uh, and so some of that exists now, but no, it's just, again, it gets back to if you have um, outside information, like, yes, there's people waiting at this bus stop, you have to stop. You can come to that stop in an eco-friendly fashion, and then you can join the traffic stream again in an eco-traffic, in an eco-friendly way. Um, so that, that's sort of what we looked at from a, a stopping point of view. It's just incorporating that if you know you have to stop, then why not make that part of the vehicle dynamics that you're trying to manage? Sure, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so another question um, I think it would be nice to get both of your perspectives on is, um, is about local freight delivery and the extent to which, you know, their, the curb space along this corridor is used for pickup and drop off and the degree to which maybe this technology, you know, could 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 help um, with traffic smoothing if um, and with deliveries going on. I don't know to the degree to which you've looked at that, Matt or, or Nathan. You guys have thought about that in the city. Yeah. So, um, you know, the the section of University Avenue that we're looking at um, has a little bit of freight, but not a lot of freight. Um, we think that these uh, technologies are very suitable to, to, to heavy duty trucks. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we have some other specific arterial corridors near the ports of LA and the ports of Long Beach, um, where the truck traffic is, you know, somewhere 50% or greater of the, of the overall traffic mix. And um, work done by our colleague, Kunuk uh, Bori Bunsumsen has done pretty significant uh, research tests with Volvo trucks and others um, to show that these traffic smoothing eco driving techniques are very applicable for trucks and smoothing up that, tra uh, that, that flow as well as the energy and emission savings. But on the innovation corridor, there really isn't enough truck traffic to make a difference. And I think most deliveries 
um, are actually done behind the buildings, right, right, Nathan? I don't think there's a lot of front end deliveries that I've seen. No, we have more of that when you get towards the downtown and we have done some uh, innovative work there with uh, camera technology, um, primarily related to buses though, because we're able to better understand their timing. Um, so we're able to you know, pick up detect buses and preempt adjacent signals to allow the buses to enter the re-enter the traffic stream um, at, in particular in a location where they have to get over to make a left turn. So we're managing that in that sense. And we have uh, made some changes to our curbside management uh, efforts to uh, allow for in particular the TNC um, use that we've seen elevated during um, the evening hours in our downtown district. Uh, freight loading, it, it can be a little tougher because the time um, used by those vehicles is a little unpredictable. Uh, and so when we try to manage that, you know, through uh, a signal, I imagine that we'd have to rely uh, a lot on um, some more advanced detection and, and we're not quite at that location yet or at that point. Okay, thanks both for that. Um... So um, we also got a couple of questions about, um, kind of, I guess, the digital infrastructure necessary to, um, to install uh, all of this equipment and, and for it to, to function. Um, has the city had to make any upgrades in terms of um, broadband or anything like that? Or what, what are kind of the, the requirements? Sure, we've, we've been right now relying on uh, some uh, individual cell radios installed by CSERT. We do have plans to move forward with fiber optic uh, installation along university. We'll be installing some soon on Iowa. Excuse me as I mute my phone. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we recognize that, you know, once you know, this is a pretty isolated test at this point, but, you know, once you get to the point where we're in full force uh, vehicle to infrastructure communication and, and back uh, to the vehicle, we're going to need to have a lot more uh, bandwidth out there. So fiber will be necessary at that point. Okay. And then I guess a somewhat related question, um, uh, maybe, maybe more for you, Dr. Barth, is as, the, um, as these types of technologies um, become more common, can you speak to just kind of the, the data um, um, aspect in terms of collecting data from drivers and, and privacy concerns about that, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so, um, you, you know, when we're in research mode and running our own instrumented vehicles, of, of course, we're collecting a lot of data from those vehicles. Um, but, um, it, you know, if you, if, you know, okay, suppose we move on to deployment where people can uh, get this technology, it can be anonymized, right? You don't need to know anything about the vehicle per se or, you know, where it's going or what it's doing. All you're doing, for example, if you have something like this camera system, you can observe uh, vehicles, uh, how much traffic there is, what the typical speeds are. That's valuable to us. So, you know, the, in my mind, there really isn't any real privacy issues or anything like that at this point. Okay, and, and maybe a follow-up question, and Nathan, I'm not sure if you're gonna chime in there, but what, what, what are the typical speeds along the corridor? What's the posted speed limit and kind of what have you seen? driving behavior. I, I, go ahead, Nathan. I, I was going to say, I believe it's posted at 35 right now right. Um, and 25 when you get into the downtown. Okay. And did I, Nathan, did I cut you off on the data question? No. Nope. Okay. Um, okay. So um, Matt, a couple other questions for you have come in. Um, one, I know it's, I know it's not your work, but there is some interest in the, the work by Dr. Ivy that you mentioned in terms of um, air quality monitoring, and if you just if you had any more detail that you could share about that work, and maybe um, any preliminary findings. Sure. Um, so so um, yeah, we're we're working on one project that's looking at the effects of uh, you know the COVID situation on traffic, and so um, Professor Ivy and a few others have looked at correlations between. Uh, how traffic went down, you know, during the initial onset of COVID, and looking at correlations with air quality. So that that study is ongoing, and as you would expect, uh, you know, the the um, 
uh, air quality does change. Um, air quality is very complicated though, right? It's not just mobile sources and it depends on weather conditions and things like that. But there are some initial correlations that are showing, um, you know, with the obviously traffic volumes going down, you know, the air quality has improved in, in a number of different areas. Um, in terms of um, other things, uh, you know, I mentioned that Professor Ivy has an NCST project that she just recently started to start to look at these correlations. And there really isn't enough information or data yet to have any, um, you know, have any uh, uh, initial conclusions at this point. Um, Dr. Ivy just chatted and said that she she's on the webinar, but I'm not, I'm not sure if I can figure out how to unmute her. So, um, uh, so um, we'll have to schedule another webinar um, with her to, to share her work sometime soon, hopefully. Um, now, we also got a question about um, the extent to which you've, you, me you mentioned electric vehicles um, and, and studying um, connected or um, eco approach and departure um, on electric vehicles as well. Could you speak to that aspect of, of the work? Yeah, so, so um, you know, all, all these things that we do in terms of eco approach and departure and these other eco driving um, things that we've been investigating, they're certainly applicable to the electric vehicle world as well. And what we're doing, of course, it doesn't affect the emissions per se, but it, it, it affects uh, the energy use on those electric vehicles. So, for example, if you employ the same algorithms and electric vehicles are taking part, you've just increased the range of that vehicle by the same percentage, 5, 10, 15 percent. So you're, you're basically, um, you know, you're, you're smoothing the um, velocity of the vehicle, which in turn is, you know, you're doing less accelerations, which lead to, you know, to, to less range. So we're essentially extending range of these electric drive vehicles when you employ these different eco driving techniques. Yeah, um, which is significant, of course. Um, so, so we also got a question about the emissions, um, emissions calculations that, that you mentioned in terms of Sorry, I'm not, <laughs> let, me, let me start again. Um, you, you had presented some findings in terms of em emission reductions from, from eco approach and departure. Um, would it be possible um, to incorporate or to, sh to basically provide that information in real time to a driver, um, not unlike vehicles, you know, will show efficiency ratings or whatever as you decelerate or accelerate? rapidly or something like that to provide that feedback in, in real time to drivers? Yeah, so so um, again, um, my colleague Kanuk Bori Bonsamson has looked at the effect of letting drivers know what's going on with their vehicles, both in terms of real time fuel economy, as well as emissions. And if you think about, um, I mean, CO2 emissions is almost directly correlated to what your instantaneous fuel economy is. So when you have those little instantaneous, you know, here's what your gas mileage is, that's basically can be used as a surrogate for your CO2 emissions. Um, and then I think, you know, over the years, we've looked at things like, you know, predicting how much uh, CO or hydrocarbons or particles are you are you generating? It's a little bit more complex, um, but but really there hasn't been too much more thought in terms of having that displayed to the to the drivers. It's mostly we think the most effective thing is fuel economy, which in turn is the same thing as CO two. There is a question. Um, that you may you may have referenced an acronym that I that I missed, so I apologize if uh, if you talked about this already. Um, but there's a question about the, how how the test bed interfaces with with the acronym Beam B E A M. Are there any plans to feed real time or dynamic traffic data into Beam? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. So Beam Beam is a standalone model, right? So you collect information on travel demand. Uh, you then look at different types of vehicles and then you do a model run. And so far we haven't incorporated any real time information into that model. 
Um, but that certainly could be done in the future, right? So you, you build a model, you mimic the current situation of a city, and then you do a future what if scenario. Uh, and then you can do some comparisons that way. But you know, if you have that real time data flowing in, you can sort of use it as a performance metric or performance analysis to see how it's, it's actually running. Um, so the answer is we haven't done that yet with the beam model, but it's certainly something we can consider in the future. Okay, great. Well, we're coming up on time here. Um, I guess I wanted to just give you both um, one last chance for any closing remarks you wanted to give or um, if there's anything that we touched on that you wanted to circle back from. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap up. Yeah, I, I think I saw one thing in the chat or the Q and A about um, you know if if <clears throat> if a company wanted to try something or if someone else wanted to do research on this. As I mentioned, uh, we're part of that Cal Testbed program, which allows uh, others to come in and join that research test testbed platform. So uh, that certainly is available. And of course, um, we're happy to share um, links and data and things like that, as well as our papers. So. Um, again, this has been uh, a real fun aspect of the uh, National Center for Sustainable Transportation, and we hope to continue building on this research for years to come. I had one thing. Uh, I saw a couple of questions in the chat about multimodal efforts, uh, first, last mile, shared vehicles. Um, the city and UCR, CSER, did recently partner to apply for grant funds for shared uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, to be deployed at several locations around the city through the Clean Mobility Options Grant. Um, that would be great if we got that funding, and I and I'm I'm hopeful that we will. Um, and uh, that would bring uh, those vehicles to this community in specific and other areas in the city. We also I, I somehow for, forgot to mention this. Um, the city uh, awarded a contract to conduct a feasibility study for a streetcar um, that is battery operated with a hydrogen fuel cell backup, um, complete zero emission infrastructure that would run uh, at least in its uh, initial concept alignment all the way down university through the innovation corridor and perhaps back on third street. So we're actively looking at alternate means of transportation um, and the uh, changes to development that would need to happen to support that in the long run. Great. Well, we will keep an eye out for updates on that effort. That's exciting. Um, well, I think we're going we're gonna to close then. Um, I just want to say thanks so much to our attendees for joining today and asking some really great, great questions. Um, we got to most of them, I think. I think we did OK. <laughs> um, and certainly, um, feel free to follow up with us. And then uh, a really big thank you both um, to you, Matt, and to you, Nathan, for, um, for sharing your work uh, on this topic. Clearly, a lot of excitement a lot of relevance right now. So thanks so much. And um, with that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll say goodbye and, and, and uh, hope you'll join us for our next webinar. And um, please um, please fill out the, the survey that'll pop up um, at the end of the webinar. We, we always love to, to um, hear your thoughts on, on how we can continue to improve. So thanks very much, everybody.